Holy Spirit's here, but let's take a moment and just welcome Him. Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you, God, for being here. We thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. It's, it's, I love the tangibility of God's presence and God's Spirit, you know? He's not this floating thing up in the sky, but He lives in me, you know? And it's cool, because because he lives in me, I could show him to others. That's right. I remember uh, we were witnessing in the park one time. We came across um, well, a group of kids, and they were just doing dubstep in the park. And this kid was just an epic dancer, you know. And there was like probably over ten of them, right? So I, I we just I feel like the Lord, like I was trying to pray for people, but like there was no opening. So it was kind of like, but I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, wait. I'm going to do something. So we just started hanging around them. Finally, three kids, I'm like, hey, do you want to experience God in a tangible way? And they're like, yeah. And one guy cracked a joke. He's like, isn't Jesus Neil Diamond? <laughs> See, Holy Spirit, like, he's not this scaredy cat that every time someone mocks you, he's like, oh, I'm staying away from you. You're, you know? Holy Spirit is a fighter. I love that. It's Holy Spirit that took Jesus and the, it said it drove him into the wilderness to defeat Satan, you know? Yes. The word drove in the book of Mark means violently hurled. Yes. Wow. So the Holy Spirit comes down and Jesus gets him. He's like, alright, come on, we're taking the devil. Yeah. That's kind of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Yeah. So I, I pray, I'm like... All right, Holy Spirit, just come, show me show real. I pray just you fill him with your presence. And then one kid's like, looks back like this. And he's all, what? Mom, what happened, man? He's all, something touched my shoulder. Mom, well, that's just Jesus. <laughs> then all the other kids are around. And then that one kid who's doing just the epic dubstep, he's like, no, what just happened? I'm all, oh, we prayed Jesus just touched his shoulder. They're like, no way, do me, do me. So now they're all like kind of like bowing their heads. And... I said, all right, everybody, just say, Holy Spirit, come. So everybody said, Holy Spirit, come. Then a couple of seconds go by, and he, all of a sudden, one kid sitting on the bench goes, <laughs> jumps. And then the other kid, like, uh, he, he's standing there, and then he jumps, and he's all, no, nah, F that. And he just takes off running, freaked out. <laughs> so at this time, you see, like, one thing I'm learning Holy Spirit, like there's a tangibility to His presence. There's yes. there's parts in the gospel where it says the power of God was present to heal. Yes. Like it, it's an actual tangible presence. So, so and here's the thing: there there is also people around me mocking me this whole time too. So this is like a complete contrast of God invading enemy territory, yes. of light shining in darkness. Yes. So, I start having them pray over one another. See, these guys aren't believers, but the reason why they're able to pray over one another is because I'm there and that anointing's in the area. Like, Saul was not following God, right? And he chased after David to go take David out, right? He comes across the prophets who, earlier you find out they're worshipping prophets. They're worshipping. They're in the presence of God. He gets hit with the presence of God and he can't but prophesy. So in the same concept, when we're walking in something, someone else could come beside us and just walk right in it, right? So I, I asked if anyone had any pain in their body, and one guy's like my wrist, and it's funny because we asked him earlier, he said he had nothing going on. But God showed up, so it just made it real, you know? So I'm like, check this out. You lay hands on his wrist, you pray, just say in Jesus' name, wrist be healed. And he goes like this, and then he like looked freaked out. And the guy's like, dude, is it better? Is it better? He's like, yeah. and he's like, and so I have them pray over his ankles, and now they're all getting into it. They pray over this kid's ankle, and his ankle is better. And then the kid who made the Neil Diamond comment, pray, uh, we have uh, the kid whose ankle got healed go over, pray over this guy's feet. And he's all, dude, this is no joke, man. <laughs> his feet got healed. And then that kid that took off, like booked it running, comes back. And he's all, oh man, you need to pray for my knee. My knee hurts. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. So they're all laying hands and they pray. And then he gets up and he's like, nah, still hurts. Sits back down and they're praying again. And it's funny, these kids are getting into it now. They're like, where's the actual spot of pain? <laughs> 
he gets healed and they're asking like can anyone do this so I just shared like Jesus said he who believes in me will do the works that I do and greater and it, it was funny because there's a girl like the whole time there's these two girls over there that were just trying to distract and they're like it's psychosomatic and then what's funny one of the kids like what does that mean and she couldn't really answer <laughs> but they're trying to distract and it's funny when i started like just uh sharing the gospel with them like they start making animal noises and trying to distract and disrupt but two kids gave their life to the lord that day <laughs> i'm realizing when we get filled with God, when we start really grasping that, it doesn't matter where we're at or who we're in front. God could touch them. I'm still growing in this, but I'm seeing that it doesn't matter what they think they believe. It doesn't matter how offended they are. It doesn't matter how bad they mock me. I've We've seen, uh, we were in a mall one time, and I saw a girl limping, and she was working. And I'm like, let me see your hands. She's all... Okay, so I pray for her, and then she starts busting up laughing at the top of her lungs. She thought it was the most silliest thing I'd pray for her. And then I pray again, and she starts laughing even harder. And then I'm like, you know, I, I, I carry a video camera, and I film a lot of stuff. So I showed her a clip of somebody getting healed, and she's like, that's crazy. So I prayed one more time. She gets healed, and she then confesses she's a Muslim, and she's like freaked out. See? She doesn't know Jesus in a tangible way. We do. See, this gospel does sound foolish. That's what Paul, the point Paul was making in uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, uh, a lot of you were here Friday night, so you heard a lot of my testimony, just kind of my background, what I came out of. Um, you see, it's one thing when you come to the Lord, but can, to continue walking in it, that's a different story, you know? Yes. See, I, I gave my life to the Lord about 11 years ago, but for six of those years, the first year was struggling with drugs, then God pulled me out of that, but then I got, once I cleared drugs, I didn't really get this relationship with God, so I was plowing through the Bible, and I, I actually knew the Bible in and out, but it's like, I got really intellectual about it. Uh -huh. So if we don't have a real relationship with God and, and your theology doesn't actually change you, it, it doesn't mean anything. See, the, your theology has to manifest for through your life for it to become power. It's not about just knowing this book. It's about living it. It's becoming it. We're called living epistles, right? So here's what happened to me. When I first gave, came to the Lord, I... Um, I was came out of a lot of witchcraft, a lot of bondage, so my mind was messed up, and I started going to online ministries and stuff like that, and just making Christian friends online, because uh, where I was at, like, I was one of the weird ones, you know, because I couldn't make friends in the church, because I was too, de like, contaminated by the world, you know, so it's kind of like... It was just a weird situation, so I started making friends online and doing online evangelism where I just witnessed to people, and I started just sharing my testimony, and then people started coming to the Lord like crazy, but then I came across atheists and evolutionists, and I'm like, wow, how do I witness to them? So I studied evolution, and I studied like just creation and how to witness to them, and I realized destroying their arguments doesn't do anything. Right, right, right. Yeah. See, you could prove something wrong, but they could always pull another thing off because their whole thing is based on a theory. See, and I remember uh, trying to witness to someone uh, like just, uh, I had friends that were atheists and I tried witnessing and I'd debate them just tooth and nail. That was my life. I was like apologetic, you know? But I never saw fruit of it. I have not seen a single person one to the Lord through debate. And that always bugged me. But when I was just sharing my testimony, people were coming to the Lord. And I'm like, what's what's up with this, you know? And I remember reading the Bible and you see like the apostles walking in some crazy stuff, right? Yes. I'm like, wow, if I could like do that, that would just prove the gospel. I could bypass the whole debate part, right? So what eventually happened is knowledge puffs up. If you don't really have a relationship with God and the love of God flowing through your heart, what you know about the Bible is actually going to hinder you from walking. Wow. Wow. It's, it's wow. going gonna, gonna to make you prideful. It's going to make you puffed up. It says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Yeah. So naturally, I got really prideful in what I knew about 
the Bible, what I knew about God, and no one could tell me different. I was, I became unteachable in a way, you know? Wow. I'd go to church thinking I knew it all, and I, I remember sitting in churches, and a lot of churches I'd go to would say the same self-help sermon, you know? That wasn't empowering, it's how you could do it yourself. And the whole Christian life was based on what you do yourself, you know? But what eventually happened was I burnt out. I uh, went back to drinking, went back to, you know, just playing video games. And I, I was a believer because I encountered God in a real way. I knew Jesus. Yeah. But I, I just went away from that. And we ended up moving from West Virginia to uh, um, Oregon, actually Washington at first. And I remember I was out there and started playing video games and just started drinking and not really paying attention to God. And I'd still tell people about God because that's just something God put in me. But I just wasn't living it, you know? Right. Then it's funny because I I, I I got to where I wasn't reading my Bible at all. And, you know, I'm like, you know, maybe I should, like, read this Bible. Like, it's the Christian thing to do, you know? So I went to a passage that was actually one of my dreaded passages in Luke um, 21 verse 34 check this out it says but take heed yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down by carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life that this day come upon you unexpectedly it's talking about the day of the Lord like Jesus is going to come back some people are going to be really ashamed when he comes back say it some people are going to shrink back in fear. It says that in 1 John chapter 2, the end. Let us not be ashamed of this coming. Amen. See, it's funny because I read that and I shut my Bible and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ignore that. And it's funny because the next day I just had that conviction in me. I'm like, I have to read my Bible because I'm a Christian. So I open it, pat that passage. I remember I grabbed my Bible. I intentionally tried opening to the Old Testament, and I'm on that passage. <laughs> it was crazy. If my Bible would fall, I guarantee it would be on that passage. Like, like I could not escape it. And then finally, one night, like God just made it so clear, and He asked me a question as I heard this in my heart. He said, what would it look like if you gave everything to me? What would it look like if everything you knew about this Bible, you lived out? Conviction. Holy Spirit's amazing at that. Yeah. 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 Yes, he is. See, it's funny because, uh, like, I see. I'm um, God's not against video games. He's not against movies. He's not against that. But he is against things becoming idols in your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So for me, that was an idol in my life. That was something that I put in the place of God. Where I got my joy, my satisfaction, I got everything out of drinking, out of playing video games, and that was kind of my source of how I get by through life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that night I, I had a dream, I went to sleep, I had a dream, and I actually saw a picture, like, where God was just showing me all this stuff in the back of a truck. And, like, I used to work truck unloading where we'd do backhauls where the empty crates, we'd put them in a truck, you know, and they'd get hauled out. And we're doing a back call in my dream, and it open and I open one, and I'm like, hey, this one's already full. They're like, no, it's not that truck, it's this truck. And I open it, and I see like Xbox, I see all this stuff, the entertainment, all, like like everything that I was living in in that truck. And they're like, this has to go right now. Wow. And I woke up, and then that's when like Holy Spirit just started bringing back that challenge. What would it look like? So she wakes up, my Xbox is in a box, all her movies are in a box, and I'm like, this stuff's got to go. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what this looks like, but I'm all in. I'm actually going to give everything up, and I'm going to live all in for the Lord. I didn't know what that looked like. I just knew God was challenging me. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing. When you make a commitment to God, there is, you're, you're going to be tested with fire. Yeah. Yeah. You see, God's, you can't make light commitments to God. You can't tell God one thing and then just kind of, you know. So I committed my life to God fully at that point, where I'm like, God, I'm all in. Regardless, I don't care what I have to give up. I don't care what. And then it's funny because the next day, like days later, I got tendonitis, so I lost my truck and loading job. And then uh, I ended up a door greeter at Walmart, and my pay kind of went down. And so we were struggling with bills. We we're struggling with all kinds of stuff, you know. And then I got a bad tooth infection, and then all this depression and all this stuff was like hitting me all at once for like a couple weeks. It was like crazy. It was like. Just the devil was beating me down. 
and then God took me to uh, Matthew where Jesus was led into the wilderness. Wow. I read that. And it's one thing powerful about uh, that, that story in Matthew. It says, you see, he didn't reveal himself in power until after that point. Yeah. See, the picture is he received the Holy Spirit, right? He gets driven into the wilderness. He gets beaten with all this temptation, but then he comes back. It says he comes back in the Spirit and power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, you commit to your life to God. It's not a joke. This isn't a game. This isn't something you just say a prayer. This It's not about the confession. It's about a life lived out. All right. Yeah. 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 You see, and your faith really doesn't mean much until it's tested or until it's put in place. That's right now. You, you could say you're following after him, but are you following after him when things get rough? Are you following after him through the trials? Yes. So God promised me at the end of this, you're going to see my glory. Amen. Praise God. So I remember we found out, uh, like, God actually led us to a church. So it was a messianic church of all places. Like Jew, Jews, they converted to Christ, and we were scared at first because they had like little hats and all these ritual. I'm like, Chelsea, keep an eye on the exit, just in case we need to bail out of here. Yeah. But the worship started, and these people really worshipped the Lord, and there's something tangible. And I was like, wow, I missed this feeling, and it brought back just the memory of how tangible God's presence is when we worship in Him. And it was crazy because I, I just kind of pr started praying it, and then Holy Spirit just started convicting me on my pride. And that was the big thing. Like, and finally I got to a point, like, you know how you confess, I lay this down, and then you pick it up a second later, you, I lay this down, I lay this down. In my heart, I literally laid it down, and something happened when I did. The worship was going, I felt fire fill my chest, right? And this like burning, it's like someone just lit a flare inside my heart. I was just, like it literally was hot. Like, my, it, I, it was crazy. So then I have my first vision. I stand up and all of a sudden I have wings stretched out like an angel, like 10 feet long. And I'm just like, what? You know, and then I switches. I see myself in third person and I have armor on. God. And I have a sword in my hand, and I'm actually in the clouds. And uh, as I'm watching this, I'm just like, just rocked and snotting tears, like, you know. And then I see this demon step toward me. It steps up, and it just falls like this on the sword. And I didn't even have to swing it, too. Like, Holy Spirit highlighted that. Yeah. See, when we're standing in God's presence, when we're standing in His glory, it's His glory that does the work. It's Him who does the work through us. See, I was used to wielding the sword really well. I could beat you down with it. But it's the presence of God that brings life to it. Yes. So so check this out. After that, I actually watched a halo appear over my head, and then my flesh got contorted like the movie Mummy, you know? Where, like, like Then I watched my body disintegrate, and I saw like a body of light. And then after that, like I heard audibly, I am the Prince of Peace, and I'm with you. Yes. Glory to God. God. Yes. It was weird. It was like oh, that was like a born again again experience. Yes. Like, it, it was insane. Like the next day, I went to work, and then someone actually walked up. He's like, "You look different." I don't. I don't know why. And I started telling him, and he was agnostic, so he <laughs> started telling him what happened. He's all, "Get away from me, dude." <laughs> and it's funny because um, man. Nah. Then right after that experience, uh, I come home and have you guys heard of a documentary called Finger of God? Anybody? Okay, it's a documentary about God's miracles and stuff he's doing around the world. And I remember I came home and my wife was watching that. And I'm like, what? This stuff is happening? Like it showed uh, kids going on the street praying for people. They're getting healed. Then it goes to Africa where Heidi Baker's um, praying for a deaf and blind in front of whole Muslim villages. And whole villages are coming to the Lord. And I'm like, that is going on. And I remember watching that, being so gripped in my heart. I cried out to God. I'm like, God, if that's going on, if that's real. Because that's what God made me for. And I always knew it. Yeah. See, that's why I was so dissatisfied. You know, that's why I walked... Is, I, I got into debating. I remember wishing I had that power, that ability to be able just to witness in power. So, so uh, it, it just, I remember crying out to God. I'm like, God, I, I don't care 
take me where this is happening. I just I want to see it. And then it was funny because I started walking to work and then the Holy Spirit started highlighting people to pray for. And I was, you see, on, online evangelism is different because you have a screen to hide behind, you know? But when it comes to like actually face to face talking to someone, that could get scary. So I'm walking to work and then I'm like, Holy Spirit's like, talk to him. I'm like, what? <laughs> Go talk to him. And sometimes I'd ignore it and walk by and then just feel that conviction. And then other times, once I, but I started just stepping out and sometimes I'd be shaking, like trembling, trying to like hold it together while I'm talking to them, you know. And then uh, I started praying for people to get healed and I saw nothing. But I wanted it. You see, the Bible says that believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, I believe that regardless what I see. Yes. This word trumps my experience in all circumstances. Yes. So we can't afford to limit the beauty of what this Bible says by what we're experiencing. That's right. Because it's through faith we receive this stuff, you know? So it was funny because uh, I came home and I actually started watching... Um, uh, Todd White on YouTube like randomly just came across him. It was like a God thing And he's praying over these college students that are evolutionists and they're getting healed. And I'm like what? And I prayed I'm like God is this even real or is this set up like what's going on with this and the Holy Spirit spoke really clear He said do you want to do that? I'm like well, yeah, that's kind of what I've been asking for you know, so he said just pray for the sick so um my wife wakes up, she has a messed up back, so I prayed for her and she feels heat just fill her back. And I was like, yes. That's so awesome. Okay, actually, let me back up. Just, God kind of wooed me into this too. Right after I saw a finger of God, my mom had a clot in her liver and she, the church prayed over and she got healed. And then... Then another circumstance, I was actually walking to work and I saw uh, one of our friends, his name's Cornelius. And he had a cane and he walked like this because one of his leg was crazy short than the other and his spine was just crooked, you know? And we gave him rides home because he couldn't make it because it was just in bad condition. I'm walking to work and he's jogging and I'm like, dude, what happened to you? You know, like, where's your cane? He's like, oh, some kids like stopped me and prayed for me. Nothing happened. I went home and I just kind of laughed about it. And then I heard, I'm going to heal you tonight. And he said, I was kind of like, yeah, right. You know? So he said, I went to sleep. And 4 o'clock in the morning, my leg goes, snap! And just shoots out. His spine gets straight. He said, I've been jogging all morning. So this is before I was actually praying for miracles. Like, God kind of wooed me into it. I'm convinced, whatever, you're, whatever you want to walk in, in the kingdom, if you're hungry for it, I believe God put that desire in you. Amen. If you want to see people get healed, start praying for the sick. Start sowing into it. You'll reap what you sow. Yeah. Whatever thing in the kingdom, if you want to walk in the prophetic, start stepping out. Start taking risks. And out of you stepping out, you're going to see God's going to give you. He's going to increase. He's going to increase. But... So anyway, so her, now back to where I was at, her back got healed, I go to church and um, there's this uh, good friend named Judy who used to be really legalistic like with the Torah and just kind of, she, but she really wanted to know the Lord. She had a love for the Bible and love for the Lord, but she was didn't really believe in miracles or anything like that and um, I she had a bad sciatica so... It was hurting, so I prayed like four or five times, nothing happened. The Holy Spirit's like, I want to heal her. I'm like, cool, let's do it. <laughs> so I kept praying, praying, and then I, I, I grabbed people around me. I'm like, you, come here, you, come here. And I actually grabbed cessationists, people who don't believe in miracles, and they're my prayer team. It's so awesome. So we go in the back room, and we start praying, and then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit goes... Phew! just comes in the room tangibly and she just hits the ground this is a 70 year old lady and then i start busting up laughing out of nowhere and i'm like oh god you better have healed her because like this 70 year old lady's laying on the ground and i'm laughing at her if she gets up and she's not healed this is going to be really bad <laughs> She gets up and she starts crying, screaming praises to God because all the pain left. Yeah. And 
this time I'm like, dog, did that really happen? Did you really heal her? You know, so I called her husband a couple days later and he said, yeah, she had to buy a new pair of shoes. Because her shoes were made to align her back. God's really good at that stuff. So, so now I'm a door greeter at Walmart, remember, at this time? This was about five, almost six years ago. And people start coming through the door and I start hearing stuff in my heart. I start hearing left hip. And I'm like, was that me? And then I'd ask and they're like, yeah, I do have this in my left hip. And I pray they get healed. And then I started seeing like five, six people a day get healed. Just walking through Walmart. Wow. Hey, welcome to Walmart. Hey, can I pray for you? <laughs> <laughs> Had crazy favor with the managers. Never got talked to once. Wow. You see, I, I know there's this fear when you're at a, in a workplace, you know? Like, um, there's this fear when you're in a workplace where you're like, if I step out or I try to talk about Jesus, I get fired, I could lose my job, I could... If you want to, God will set it up for you. Period. Yeah. That's a desire on your heart. If that's, because that's a big desire on his heart. And guess what? If you do happen to be blessed by getting kicked out or blessed by getting fired, he'll open up a door for you to minister more. Yeah. So I remember I was thinking, my old mind frame also was if I was around Christians all the time in Bible college, I could be a stronger Christian, you know, and I'm stuck working at Walmart with all these unbelievers. And that was kind of my mind frame, you know, we get in that. Yes. Where our, our environment just kind of like we get so influenced by our environment or people we're around because we're not influenced by this thing enough yes. and by him enough. So I remember I, I was listening to Todd White and he was preaching and then he said, I don't care if you're a do uh, working at Walmart, your job is your mission field. I'm like, wow. conviction. <laughs> <laughs> so, God, ah. so Walmart became my mission field and I was just praying over people. They're getting healed like crazy. And it was just amazing. And here's one thing I, I, I want to bring up. There's something about just the simplicity of the gospel and the power of God. See, we make it complicated. Like, this is something... We make it really, really complicated, and it's really, really easy. See, I used to be... When I was in apologetics, I remember I would have to try to dress and skirt the gospel to look appealing to people. You know, we can't do that. We pat it. We try to add intellectual words to it to make it sound more appealing. We try to add little hooks here and there, but... The gospel is supposed to sound foolish to the world. That's the way God set it up, period. It's not the gospel. It's the power behind it that backs it up. Amen. See, Paul, he went to uh, Athens, and I think it's like Acts 17, right? He gets provoked by their idols, and he sees a statue, unknown God, you know, and he goes in and he starts preaching to them. And he has amazing apologetics there. He even quotes their uh, own poets, showing them the reality of God. But one thing he didn't do is there's no power behind it. See, that's the one thing that was different from anywhere else he shared the gospel was it wasn't backed up with power. It was backed up with trying to make it appealing to their intellect. Yeah. Very few people received him, and they kind of mocked him, they scoffed him, and they, you know? But the very next place he witnesses is Corinthians. That's the next place he travels. And in his letter to Corinthians, he... He says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech and wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. See, he was even scared to share this message, but said... And my speech and my preaching were not persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should be in the wisdom of men and not the power of... Or, I mean, your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, right there, when we demonstrate the gospel and power, it automatically puts people's faith in the power of God rather than the wisdom of men. See... That's powerful because there's a lot of people who's been manipulated into the gospel. There's a lot of people that's been kind of hooked in or the, you know, 
and it's twisted, but their relationship with God is only based on what they know in Scripture. And there's there's a difference, you know, that like a lot of people are into sports. There's a difference between knowing everything about your favorite sports star, right? You know, his biography, his stats, his statistics, all this stuff. It, there's a way big difference because if you walk up to him, he doesn't know you. Yeah. See, there's a difference between knowing all about God and knowing God. Yes. That's a huge difference. Yes. See, when with, with this gospel, it's really simple. It's just simply God loves humanity. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. We were separated with him because sin entered the world, so he paid the price for sin so he could be back we could be back in fellowship with him. It's really easy. He said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and the Christ whom you've sent. So he puts eternal life on a relationship with him. So the heaven, hell, all the everything hinges on this relationship with God. It breaks my heart because I was in a Bible college that was mostly cessationist where they, they used to be hardcore, like um, cessationist means they believe the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. So they, it was mostly, used to be hardcore cessationist to the point where they had, you're not allowed to speak in tongues in the rule book. But um, they, they just opened it up to more charismatic people, so I was one of the first people in there. Like, And it, it was crazy because... One of the big issues was people would get their master's degree and they would just say, you know, I don't believe in God anymore. Wow. That breaks my heart. Yeah. See, I, and that was a big battle because I remember sitting in a classroom and the professor, professor said, um, if, you, if you hear a voice in your head, it's just immature Christianity and that's not what it's talking about being spirit led. See, so you have think about this though. These are future pastors who go to the school. This this isn't just a church, or this is actually the place where pastors are trained up to pastor the congregation. Whatever is put into them at this school is going to be put into their congregation at their church when they have one. See, and it's really crazy because in America, a lot of people have that mindset that God's this distant God up there. He doesn't interact. And it's kind of like, and it's crazy because we even treat God's will like that. Yeah. It's like whenever something bad happens, it's God's will. Whenever yeah, something yeah. good happens, it's God, you know? Yeah. But there's a contrast you see in the devil. Uh, or the, in the Bible, you see a contrast between the devil and God. Yeah. See, Jesus said, I've come to give life more abundantly. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. See, we, and here's the thing too. Our actions actually have a cause and effect to, with the world around us. When we follow after the Lord, when we're listening to the Spirit, it actually changes lives around us. It actually betters our community. It transforms things. But if we're following the devil, same thing. Except for the negative. See, our works and our life becomes killing, stealing, destroying, and people get hurt. Yeah. And here's the thing. It's not God's will in that. God's will is... God never has a will for someone to follow the devil, period. Amen. But when people follow the devil, it has consequence. Just like when you follow the Lord wholeheartedly, it's going to have a consequence. The consequence is positive, though. Right. Yeah. See, the consequence is people around you are going to get rocked by the love of God. Amen. Okay. So I'm going to try to get back on track. I just got like so much like in my heart right now. But this, like, here's, check this out. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1. It says, Paul said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made known in effect. No effect. So he's saying that with, when we start trying to add the wisdom of words, when we try try to dress the gospel up to sound appealing, it's going to lose its power. See, that's what I did, and that's why I wasn't seeing the fruit I was seeing. When I was just sharing the testimony, the testimony is basically releasing grace for people to receive it. When I was sharing my testimony, how people, I came to the Lord, it's at, it has a prophetic element where the Holy Spirit starts confirming the work he did, right? Amen. But when I started getting in apologetics and debating people and trying to bring the gospel to appeal to man's wisdom, 
it didn't, God didn't back it up. See, it didn't, I was trying to preach the gospel with wisdom of words, and it just robbed it of all effect. See, we need to stick to the simplicity of the gospel. We need, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's like we get to be in a relationship with God, and we get to show it off to the world. Amen. Now, check this out. It says in verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. I would, for it is written, I would destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God not made the foolish, or not, has God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in wisdom, or in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, and it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Yeah. So, this message is foolishness to the world. They're not going to get it. They're not going to understand it. And through their own wisdom, they're not finding God. Amen. That's why uh, a lot of evolution is based on rational thought and how you can rationalize things and how you can see things. But what they do is they cut out all experience and they cut out everything spiritual. So when you only look at the natural, that's all you're going to see. You're not going to find God through the wisdom of this age. You find God through... He says it's a fullest message of the cross. Yes. It's, it's God became man and he paid the price for all my sin. Yes. Simple as that. And God will back up that message. Amen. So, uh, God, I love you, Jesus. Can I just pray a second? Would that be okay with you guys? Yes. Oh, Lord, Father, I just praise you and thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this gospel, Lord. We thank you for... We thank you, Lord, that we get to know you. You're amazing, God. Okay. nowhere to go now. <laughs> we're, we're blessed to have the Baptist and the Spirit, right? Yeah. Do you remember what uh, Jesus said about the Baptist and the Spirit? It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So why, why do we have the baptism of the Spirit? To be witnesses. See, the baptism of the Spirit is not, not just to stay in a church and uh, bless other fellow believers, but it's to be a witness to the world. Like, one thing I, I'm com really convicted of is if we want to see more breakthrough in the church, we need to be a witness to the world. Like, I know, I know I've just seen a lot of a lot of people is trying to get God to work for them, you know? They're, they they huddle and they'll pray and pray and pray with no fruit of it. They'll, they'll, you know, and it's just they're trying to pray and conjure up something or trying to do something to get God to move, but the reality is God moved on the cross. Yeah. We're stepping into that. He gave us His Spirit. He gave us His, his power. He says, go. You see, I'm, I'm finding... In Portland, it's interesting because uh, a lot of churches are really waking up to this message of take it to the streets. And there's been a lot of prophetic words in Portland that the revival of Portland's on the street. Yeah. Amen. The old, I mean, God, there is revival where God does a sovereign move in a place and draws huge crowds to a place. That's yeah. happened again and again in history. Yeah. But that's not the revival I'm looking for anymore. All right. All right. See, I have Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is revival wherever He's manifesting. Yeah. I have Jesus. Find me a place in the gospel where Jesus walked and there wasn't revival breaking out. Amen. See, Amen. that means if I'm in the store, if I'm in a mall, if I'm in a restaurant, see, I have Holy Spirit and I have Jesus and God could wreck the place. He could turn the place upside down. 
See, I'm no longer dependent on how much I know or this or that. I'm dependent on Him and it's a relationship with Him. And I don't read this book just so I can be a good scripture quoter. I read this so I can become it. Yeah. See, I, so good. <laughs> but but it's, it's the Holy Spirit. He's amazing. He empowers us to be witnesses. When we're filled with the Spirit, when we're baptized with the Spirit, that means Holy Spirit sets up camp inside us, changes our heart. And he said, God said, well, baptize with us with the Spirit and fire. Fire consumes everything it touches. When we're filled with the fire of God, it's, it's unquenchable. You can't put it out. You try to, it's just going to burn hotter. No, seriously. It's, and, and here's the thing. It's Holy Spirit that teaches us all things. I love teachers. And I we need pastors. We need teachers. And I think even Bible college is an amazing thing. But we need the Holy Spirit to breathe life on this word. This word needs to become life and not head knowledge. Okay, turn to John chapter 5. Verse 39. Back in the day, the Pharisees, they knew the Bible in and out. They actually could quote the whole entire Torah just by memory. Because they had to be, to be able to be in that place. Which, that's just insane. Could you imagine memorizing the whole Bible and just, someone says, hey, where's this? And you're able to quote anywhere in the place of the Bible, right? See, these Pharisees knew the scriptures and they knew it well. But here's something that it's crazy, Jesus said to him. He said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Wow. Our life is in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is actually God with us. It's Jesus. And he calls it the Spirit of the Son in one place, and the Spirit of the Father in another place. See, when... when God says, me and my Father will make our home in you. He's talking about through the Holy Spirit living in us. Yeah. That's right. And when the Holy Spirit manifests, He's God. And a lot of people kind of made the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. That's not cool. See, we need the Holy Spirit to make bring life to this Word to, and to manifest this Word through our life. Yes. Yes. It's, not, it's so not about knowing this, it's about becoming it. Yes. Amen. See, but here the Pharisees knew this in and out, you see, but they didn't see Jesus when he was right there. See, and that scares me too. It shows you can know this book and not know God. Let's do the, I'm going to do the flip side of this just to be fair, because there's people on the spirit side who neglect the word, you know? And here's, so just, just, just so I have the contrast, not in uh, Matthew, Turn to Matthew chapter uh, 7. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, have we, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and performed, done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, that right there shows it's not just about power. It, it's not, see, the scripture brings us into a deeper revelation of who God is, and therefore Amen. we can know him in a deeper way. Amen. The power of God backs him up. It backs up his gospel. It empowers us to live righteously. It empowers us in him. Hallelujah. See, I, I'm finding when people claim to be spirit-led, and the, the spirit they're led by leads them away from the Bible, that thing needs rebuked out of them. <laughs> it's, it's not the Holy Spirit. Yes. Holy Spirit will always lead you in a deeper revelation of, of this book Amen. and a deeper revelation of what the gospel means. Yes. Of it. See, I love the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. It's the Holy Spirit. So that means if you're really following after the Holy Spirit, the fruit is going to be holiness in your life. Yes. Right before that, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. So you have people who can know the Bible in and out and there's no fruit in their life. And you can have people trying to walk in power. And, and what's crazy is 
the power of God and the gifts of God are without repentance. It says that in Romans. So they don't depend on how much of a good person we've been. They're a free gift of grace. So that means someone can actually be twisted walking in power. See, that scares me. I don't want. I want my heart to be right before the Lord. I want to personally know Him. Yes. And I, I want to become like Him. I want to be so filled with Him when people meet me, they're like, "Wow, I met Jesus today." <laughs> I've had people say that on the streets too. Like I remember this one girl. I walked up and I just said, "Hey, can I can I pray for you? Can I bless you?" And she's like, "Nah, I'm good." You know. And then I start talking to her, and then. God started revealing that she grew up in the church and she she's the type of person who actually has a high standard of herself, you know, and she's the type of person who doesn't want anyone to see her break even though she can't hold the weight, so she hides. And I start telling her that and I and God revealed this because her family, like the background and stuff like that, she came from a church where there's a high expectancy of her morals and her this and that, but it wasn't really a relationship with God. It was more do this and this and this and this, you're cool with God, you know? So she actually ran away from God, but she still has this consciousness of her, her like standing. And I just told her, I said, I feel like God's saying that you need help sometimes. Yeah. Like you, you stand strong for your friends, but you, you need to receive help sometimes. And I, she was like, wow, that's like so exactly what I'm going through. And she started freaking out. And I prayed over her. She encountered God's presence. Yes. She had a headache, which this is really minor, but God took it away. Which was awesome because that was a confirmation to her. And here's the thing: I don't force people into praying my prayer. A lot of times, like I believe Jesus is a gentleman, and and he's pursuing his bride with passion. So he's not gonna force someone into this relationship with him. He's he's always open invite, like when you're ready, you know. So she said she's not ready to give her life to the Lord, you know. And I'm like, you know what? Just whenever you're ready, he's there for you and he loves you and he's always going to be for you. And she said, wow, thank you. She said, so I guess I met the real Jesus today, huh? Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, Jesus is amazing. Yes, he is. And here's the thing, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Yes. There's freedom. Actually, in that passage, it actually says, it's uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, Wait, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. So right there, it, the Holy Spirit's God, period. It's God with us, it's God in us, it's God manifest. When He moves, it's God actually moving. And He lives in us. See, and He brings freedom everywhere. One thing, I, I, I'm just going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Is that cool with you guys? Because I just feel like I, I, I love Him. Like... He, he's amazing. He's everything. See, Lord, thank you, God. Amen. It says in uh, John fourteen twenty six. He says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring bring to your remembrance the things that I said to you. Yes. Yeah. So we have the Holy Spirit in us, and he's our teacher. Yeah. How he teaches us is diverse and different a lot of times. Sometimes we'll read the Bible, and he'll just start enlightening us with revelation. Sometimes he'll inspire your, your pastor to say a word, and it's going to hit. But when the Holy Spirit's revealing it, it no longer is head knowledge, it's revelation. And when it becomes revelation, it becomes a part of you. It changes you. It actually fills your heart. That's right. And uh, just just question, how many of you guys have ever like opened your Bible and read something and then you go to a church and someone's preaching it? Yeah. That's, that's happened to everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit speaking. Amen. See? Ah, oh, that's so good. See, he teaches us, and we need to trust that he's willing to teach us. Amen. You know? Like, I remember we went to that Messianic congregation I was talking about, and the rabbi there was so in love with the Holy Spirit. He was one of the most, he had the most reverence I've ever seen anyone have for the Holy Spirit. And when he talked about the Holy Spirit, this 
intense, tangible holiness would fill the room. Where it's like you couldn't help but to reverence because the sense of God's presence there. And when we first started going there, we actually were new to the messianic thing. So we had some friends get really twisted in it where they started believing they were under Torah. They believed that Paul was basically deceived. And they started like actually rejecting scripture over it. They started believing that all Christians are not saved because they're not obeying Torah. And here's the thing. We're brand new to this stuff. And they're, they could go to scripture and show you stuff. And anyone could twist scripture to make it sound good and make it sound appealing. So, so I was in a place where I'm brand new to this whole thing. So I'm like, all right, God, I can't trust myself and I can't trust them. I need you. Yes. Holy Spirit, you teach me all things. And I held on to that passage in this time. You know, I'm like, God, you te you're a teacher. you got to show me. So it's funny because God kept showing me all throughout the Bible how we're no longer under the law. We're under love, a brand new covenant. And God, over and over, even to the point where, like, he confirmed it with gold dust, which was crazy. But check this out. One... One, all right, one day we're doing street ministry late, way later on, and I had a friend from that, back, that background who wanted to join us. And then out of nowhere, he blows up on me and just basically kind of goes off on this Torah rant. And then basically, yeah, it was just really demonic, really twisted. And he kind of, like, and it's weird because God told me he was going to do that before he did. I'm like, okay. So... I was praying. I'm like, God, how come all my all these people that we were good friends with that used to be really on fire for the Lord fell in this twisted doctrine? And how? What was the reason why I you brought us out of it? And here's the passage he brought me to. He turned to Luke chapter 11. Verse nine says, so I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. So whatever we seek God for, with if we have an honest heart, a lot of times we'll seek God, but we don't really want the answer. We want to hear the answer we want. <laughs> when we seek God with an honest, open heart, He's going to answer every time. He's going to show you, and He's not going to allow you to be deceived. Now check this out. It says in verse 11, If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Yes. Wow. It was crazy when I read that because there's a chapter right before this which I believe every believer should know this. Like this should be tattooed on everybody's heart. But Jesus said, it's the 70, you know, the 70 return and they're all rejoicing because they're casting out demons now. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven before. Hold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Yes. And over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he's saying he gave them all authority over scorpions and serpents. And right here, he, he's using it in a parable. You got a stone, you got scorpions and serpents. In relation to like, if a son asks for bread, will he give him a stone, you know? So here's the thing. If you're asking the Father purely for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to allow a demonic spirit to latch on, to yes. deceive you. Yes. He's not going to allow your heart to get hard, the stone. Let's see? That, that's amazing, but that will keep you right there. Yes. See, if because I know there's a lot of crazy doctrines coming in the bottom, like always. The devil's yeah. always, throughout all history, has always had yeah. some type of new doctrine to try to twist people or some new twist. Yeah. But if we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and we allow Him to be the authority of our understanding, Him to be the authority of our revelation, and we're like, Holy Spirit, we need you. Yeah. And and I'll be aware, sometimes he'll correct you through people, sometimes he'll speak through people, and he speaks many different ways, but it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Yes. See, that's something that will keep you safe. And like that's kind of like 
like with the with the, this Bible, I'll pray. I'll be like, God, I have to become this. Holy Spirit, reveal this to me in a way that I become it. Amen. So I, the world should look at us and see this Bible just through our lives. Our lives should show the gospel in every aspect. You know, it's so good. Glory. Oh. And he's some, he empowered us. Yes. Now, we can know this Bible. Like I'm not saying the intellect's a bad thing at all. Because the intellect's amazing, but it has to be a servant to the Spirit. Amen. See, when our intellect is dominant, you see, we're trying to figure things out in our own strength, our own flesh, and it actually gets twisted. Amen. We can sound good. But it's not going to have power behind it. I would rather have the power of God and be right with God than to think I know something and be proudful about it. See, the Holy Spirit will keep you. He'll govern you. I love that about the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm trying to find this one passage real quick. Oh, right here. In John, turn to John 14. Verse, I'll start at verse 15. It says, if you love me and keep my commandments. Or, if you love me, keep my commandments. What's his commandment? Love. love. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So, get to know Him. He lives in you, and He's going to be with you forever. Yes. He's the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it never, it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Amen. Now, here's something. Remember I brought up the concept about how people could kind of walk in the anointing and operate? Right there kind of shows the Holy Spirit was with them. He was upon them, but He wasn't in them at that point when He told it. He said, He will be in you. Yes. So the disciples throughout the Gospels walked in miracles, walked in the power because the Holy Spirit was upon them. Same thing. If you're walking anointing, someone can come alongside you and just walk in it. Yeah. See, to keep it and to keep walking in it and to impart it, there's a price for that. Yes. Yes. That's See, but here's the main point I was bringing with this passage. In verse 18, he says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Yes. So, right there points at the Holy Spirit as the primary way that God fathers us. See, when we start knowing who the Holy Spirit is, trusting in Him, speaking to Him, like I talk to the Holy Spirit because He's God. Yes, you know, God's not... There's not this weird awkwardness where like, oh, Holy Spirit's getting more attention than Jesus right now. Or, oh, Jesus is getting more attention. They're, they're in a unity. They're one. They're God. Yes. See, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We worship all of them in one. We worship yes. Him. He's God. Yes. See, so Holy Spirit is Jesus living inside me. Praise God. It's the Christ that's in me. And it calls him the hope of glory. So the Holy Spirit is my hope of glory. But right there it says that's the primary way God fathers you. He's a good father. And when you come to the kingdom, when you're born again, you're actually born of God. Not of the will of man, but of the will of God, as it says in um, John chapter 1. Yeah. So you become born of God, and your spirit actually becomes joined with the Holy Spirit. Now think, I want you to think about that for a second. Like, this is how close we are to God right now. Hallelujah. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse uh, 17. It says, but he who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. See, our spirit's joined with his spirit. We're one spirit with God. That's how close God is to us. He's with us wherever we go. We can't leave him. 
And here's the thing. I'm finding a key to breakthrough is my awareness of that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a huge key to seeing God manifest in your daily life is actually just being aware He's there. Mm. Like a lot of times, I remember um, I was... Uh, me and uh, my wife were at Target. You guys have Targets out here, right? Yeah. Okay. So we were at Target, and I'm just walking through, and I just close my eyes, and I'm like, thank you, Lord. I just start feeling his presence, and I just start worshiping the Lord in the middle of Target, you know, just <laughs> meditating on him, you know? <laughs> you don't have to just be in a church to worship God. It should be a part of your daily life everywhere. So I start feeling like his presence just come on me, and I'm like literally feeling drunk, like wobbling, like, yeah! Target! <laughs> and then this lady walks by in her arms in a cast. I'm like, oh, check this out. So I ran up, I'm like, hey, what happened? She said, oh, I broke my hand. I'm like, check this out. Let me pray for it. She's like, okay. So I pray for it, and she's like, feels better. I'm like, yeah, isn't that amazing, you know? And it was funny. It was an effortless. Uh, I talked about overcoming fear. You know, there is a part when we overcome fear by just throwing ourselves into it. We have to step out. We have to get past that barrier. But when we're, we're, if our focus is on the presence of God, and we're like, like, here's the thing. When you're worshiping and you start praising and singing to God, how many feel God's presence in a tangible way? You like feel Him, right? He's like there. Now, would it be easier to talk to people, minister to people, if you're in that feeling? In that presence. So that's something I'm realizing. It's like if you if you know you go to a bar, the drunker you get, the bolder you get. The more filled with his presence you get, the bolder it's it's over. So you get filled with his presence and it's boldness. Okay. So I'm just I'm gonna I'm just gonna wrap wrap it up with this testimony. But um so here, so that same day we go to another store, like a Dollar Tree store, and there's this guy holding his arm, and, and it's funny because my focus is completely on God. It's not even on ministry. It's not on praying for people. It's just I'm enjoying God wherever I'm at. And then he, this guy happens to say "ow" in front of me and holds his arm. <laughs> To pray for him, it gets healed. And he actually chased me through the back of the store to talk to me about God. Mm. And and here's the thing. We all have the Holy Spirit. He should be your best friend. You need to know Him. You need to rely on Him to teach you. And if you're not filled with them, ask. It says, ask and you'll receive. Seek after the Holy Spirit. If you're not filled with His power, get it. And the purpose of it is to be a witness. See, you can know everything in your own mind and you can know this gospel in and out, but without the empowerment of the Spirit, it's not going to mean anything. It's not going to have life. So I think that summarizes like what I was saying. So Lord, I just thank you. I praise you, God. Holy Spirit, we, we just thank you, God. In Jesus' name, I just pray your anointing will fall right now in Jesus' yes, name. Jesus. I thank you, God, yes. that you'll just make people's hands hot right now that want to walk in healing, God. That yes. people start feeling your presence and heat on their hands, God, just to confirm, God. And that you just impart a boldness to step out, God. I thank you, God, for just a prophetic, God, that you just pour out the prophetic on this congregation, God. That when people walk in here, they'll convince that there is truly a God. I just thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name, God, bless them, bless them, Lord.